Okay, so we'll start off on the reptiles bit today. And uh, like you said, it might seem like an Abel Mujemar situation just because of the hmm, difficulty in or the level of perceived difficulty creating those textures and scales. But um, it's, uh, I'll try and simplify it for you. Because after all, it is just form. And in this case, it is multiple forms that are uh, constructed in a certain manner to create that uh, texture. And we just have to translate that into lines. So I'll try and keep it easy. We'll start off with first making a rough sketch with a lot of scribbles. So the scribbles will... Uh, help you to create a semblance of the texture without getting into the detail of the texture first. So you become familiar with, I guess, the geography of that uh, creature. And in that process, you will become familiar with the interplay of lines. And then we can move to the next part where we can then start detailing that out as well. So I'm going to give you some tips about sketching. Um, you need to have a nice sharp pencil for this simply because we have very detailed textures. So a blunt pencil will just make very large, thick, blunt lines. And um, you might find that they're not satisfactory. A blunt line is equal to, I guess, uh, an image that is not sharp. So if you look at uh, photographs, even black and white pictures, you will notice that you enjoy seeing pictures which are sharp and uh, lines are clear. So we want to recreate that same feel. So a sharp pencil would be good. Uh, with your pencil also, just check if your pencil is dark enough because we need adequate contrast. So if you're using an HB pencil, you will have a smaller range. If you have a 2B pencil, the range will be slightly wider. We won't use more than one pencil if we can help it. And additionally, if you have a mechanical pencil, then that will help reach the detailed parts better. So a 2B pencil and a mechanical pencil. And today we will keep the flexible eraser handy in order to just um, uh, erase some lines which would be construction lines and they don't interfere with the texture lines. So I'll demonstrate all of this as we go along. There is no guessing required. And if you have any questions at any point, just stop me and ask me. So I'm using this uh, Camlin pencil. This is really nice. I've recently found it. They've been promoting this new set of pencils. It's called an HD pencil, like D for Delhi. It's uh, the brand is Camlin Supreme HD, super dark. I have a feeling it's somewhere between 2B and 4B. It's a very soft pencil, very dark. Because it is soft, it also... Um, leaves or uh, the paper very easily so i'm going to recommend using a guard sheet or a sheet that you can keep uh, just an a5 sheet even an old bill or something will be fine underneath your hand and uh, if you have an old sock you can just cut off the top portion, like cut off the foot and uh, make a small slit, really a tiny slit because this is going to expand and use that as a sleeve for your hand. That way the oils of the hand will not cause um, your lead or your graphite to smudge. 
Okay, so let me go over the pictures that I have shared. The first picture is a black and white image and now I don't even know whether this is a real photograph or it's a digital illustration or it is whatever. But I'm not going to be bothered with that too much. It gives us a very nice range of textures and a close-up of the image of the snake. Then we have what obviously look like snakes, uh, photographs, but not a close-up. So you'll see that the details around the face are a little blurred and you may or may not be able to create them accurately. But you get a nice sense of the overall texture and uh, structure of the body. Here we have a better picture, slightly clearer, but here the body is obscured. So uh, whenever you are trying to draw a picture of an animal, look for multiple images. Just having one image may not be sufficient. So you can take one image, say you can take the body part or the whole of the body from this image and where you need more data for the face, you could move to this image or this image and in time you'll be able to translate what you see in this face, though it is facing towards the left of the frame and this picture is facing to the right of the frame, what parts in this face will be substituting the right parts in this face, more or less. All right, so we can begin with, uh, okay, these are the snakes. And then I've sent a couple of pictures of uh, uh, two iguanas, which are very nice to illustrate as well, because they're full of color. So we try and make a sketch of these. And also another very detailed picture of the just the face of probably a tree snake or something. Even this looks fake when you see them so close. I have hardly ever seen any snakes in my life, except when we went to the snake park. That's about it. And sometimes I feel it's unfortunate because if I were to see a snake today, I'll be spooked. I should not be. So this is another nice sketch to make of the details of the scales. So to begin with, let us start with this image because it gives us a larger structure. In the body also, you will notice that there is a dorsal and ventral side. There is the, the peak of the spine, the folds of the, the skin, some overlapping. So we'll try and draw all of these. Um, just for the structure and then scribble over some texture. In some parts where you have highlights, there the lines will be light and few. In other parts where you have shadows over there, the lines will be darker and um, numerous. So if you want, I, I would just like to demonstrate this. Give me a couple of minutes. Just observe this first and then you can start sketching also because I would like you to see how you should hold the pencil and approach an illustration like that. Normally, um, a beginner at art would hold the pencil very close and try to draw line after line like that. That's fine to go by, but that has limitations in how much you can draw. So the first thing to do is restrict the size of illustration you're making. Don't make it a whole full page. I would say this entire exercise can be conducted on this whole page. We draw a few small illustrations here in pencil and then one final illustration in paint. So when you have a small area, hold your pencil far away and just use, just loose lines to create a, not even a full outline, but just a, spatial uh, distribution of your subject. So you, you can draw a curved line like this, you know that. And then how far do you think it can go? So you draw the neck, one fold about this much and so much. So you get an idea of the space you need. 
Uh, the next thing to do is keep looking at the lines and how they curve. So over here, the curve is fairly round. Then it comes dips in and then it's slightly straighter and then it straightens to the bottom. Now at this point, often we might be tempted to draw it straight as in horizontal. But whenever you see a line, look at any one end of the line and try to flatten it and see what direction it is pointing at with as almost as if it were on a face of a clock. So if this is the center of a clock, this line is going towards maybe somewhere between two and three o'clock. That's all you need to see about this line. It could be a snake, it could be a table, it could be uh, a person's nose, but the line and the direction of the line remains the same. So you draw this, if the line goes through, you can draw it through. And try to draw these lines without moving your pencil off the surface of the paper. And keep adjusting the line. going back and forth and changing the grip constantly. So I'm not just drawing this, but sometimes my pencil is like this, sometimes it is like this, so that I get the smooth, the smooth texture of the line efficiently. Now in this jumble of lines, somewhere there is uh, the correct line that I want. So after I have done this, from any position where I can clearly see what the final line is, I'll start building the structure of that reference image. And at this point, I can do as much detail work as I want. And for detail, it helps to hold the pencil close. Because now you don't need to know how where the line has to go, where you have to throw it. Here, you know that the line is going in one particular direction to a particular distance, and you can then start giving it its character. Okay, do you want to try this part? And then I'll come back to the texture once we've drawn the whole uh, snake. At every point, keep looking at the reference image. Now at this point, you'll see how the front of the cobra, there's a line that comes like this. And the edge of this part of the snake moves behind this line. So there's a fold. In all uh, objects in nature, you will notice these things that items fold into each other like even with our hands for example you don't see that this finger and this finger comes and joins in one place there's a fold and from the from behind the fold the next finger comes out the snake is doing exactly the same thing it's pretty much like this 
but this is in the front. So there's a line that comes lower and from behind that, the body of the snake goes out. So do make this line. Over here, it is only seen as a dark part of the texture against a highlight over here, but do make that line. If you don't make the line, then our snake is going to start looking very two-dimensional. Here as well, you have the top part. You can see this line in texture going to the further edge like this. And the inside edge almost comes like this and joins over here. When your line has to pass through, in this sketch, just go through it. Go through the uh, body. If you are seeing the reference image on an upright scene, then hold your book up at an angle. If you are seeing the image uh, horizontal or if you want to draw horizontal, then keep your reference image right next to it so that your eye travels quickly from one point to another. Shall I continue with the texture or do you need a couple of minutes? Okay. Now for the texture, first let's take on the easy task. Look at the lines on the, or the scales on the chest. They are also indicative of thickness and dimension. So you don't make them necessarily parallel to each other. In some places, they are relatively horizontal. Some places they lean lower, like over here. And these are, after all, the only lines that will tell us of the, um, the direction the creature is facing. How round it is. And you'll notice that they also turn sideways. This is the only part which has the flattish scales. Then we have a whole bunch of scales which you can make with this kind of scribbly stroke, just a zigzag up and down stroke. 
Now make this very light. Like, and you could also construct it almost like a scallop shape. Scribble. So there's a little bit of structure in there as well. And in that scribbling, you can also scribble a little dark in a few crevices to create the illusion of scales as you go along. So the first sketch is just about being able to scribble lines. Scribbling generally comes very easy to people. And this scribbling is fairly regular also. Just look for the line of the texture. And essentially we're just making zigzag lines, small and big. Even though this seems like scribbling, this itself is exercise for your hands. You'll notice that scribbling uh, can be can take some time. It feels like why am I taking so much time to just make a textured line like this? I should be able to do it easy. But we are uh, we don't do this usually. So unless you are practiced in scribbling and scribbling in all directions, different sizes of lines, this can take time. And this builds a uh, certain stability in your arm. So the currently the muscles that you'll be working on will be your wrist muscles, your finger muscles, and I think part of your palm also, because it's not tight enough. It's literally like the abs of your hand. So you are holding the pencil, but your if you keep your wrist down, your then your hand is a little fingers are a little wobbly, and you don't know where the pencil is going and then when you develop the strength you know exactly where your fingers grow go and um, in a in one way it's a good thing because it has little to do with uh, your just your ability to draw and then so you know if you build up uh, finger strength this will get better and in another way, it feels like until you have that strength, nothing is going to happen. But that's not so. Okay, now, in order to give depth over here, we need to add some dark spots. So if you don't have part of the reference image, if it was only this and you have just imagined the rest of the body, one easy go-to is to look for the underbelly or underside of the item. It usually always has a shadow and it will give you adequate roundness. Then wherever this line has overlapped, just behind that would either be a shadow or a highlight. Like in this case, the shadowy part is below, which is the underside and the highlight is over here. And the dark parts, I normally just fill it out with some kind of texture, but with an imagined part of the coil so that it does not look like just one blob of black. So you should have at least five or six different tones in your pencil sketching. Uh, tones are nothing but grays. You'll come across a lot of fancy terms like that. But essentially, it's just to, to differentiate. When you say gray, what if you're using a sepia pencil? 
then you can't say gray because it's going to be red. That's why then tones becomes a more neutral term to use. But for the most part, for us, look for me, look to make about six different grays. And you don't have to physically count them. Just look at the grays you are making and see if within a neighborhood you have a medium or two mediums, one very light, one very dark. That's also good enough. Now, these scales in the on the front of the uh, snake, you notice that they are shaded only on one side. But don't shade them vertically. Shade them horizontally. And if you can, leave that gap between the scales unshaded in some sections. And in some sections, just underneath the scale, in exactly that same gap, you will put a thin shadow. That shadow will already be there because of the uh, line of the scale. And the places where you leave it light, those will be your highlights. Now for the eye, I have my own go-to technique. We can basically see that the eye is just one bead, like a dark bead with a highlight. So you make an outline around it, leave a little highlight on one side, like a little round. And you can do this with a mechanical pencil and shade the rest of it a dark color. Around that, make a little membrane. Darken the sides a little bit. And I am getting this only from the picture itself directly. A little mouth that is an inverted curl. And from there, we can pull out its forked tongue. So we are now at a medium level sketch. Uh, there's a little extra bit over here which I want to draw. This looks like the snake's body is flattened over itself and then has expanded back over here. That's looking so nice. I don't want to miss out on that. So I'm adding that a little bit. There we go. And now to this, we can add a nice shadow. So mark some lines like that, which are just underneath and sometimes parallel to the shape made by the snake but only on one side here you will see that the shadow falls just in a parallel line below here also we are making a fake parallel line but the shadow falls right below and here you can just make maybe horizontal lines And maybe vertical lines, depending upon the space. And instantly your snake starts looking like it's right there, sitting there. Okay. How's everyone's snake looking? Can I have a look? 
Oh, wow. Beautiful. Very nice. Cool. Oh, very nice, Elaine. Wonderful. Okay, the next one, we'll make the, I don't know which one to make finally with color. So that one should take, uh, maybe we can make the gray, first gray one. Uh, but it's black and white. So let's forget the color over here, but we can focus on the texture. This one will be wonderful to make in pencil. Um, so let's begin this and then I will come back to one iguana for a quick sketch and a paint job. So here, I don't think I need to go over the shape bit. We have a nice triangular head on top and then a leaf-like face that comes down. We will make only this much. We won't try to make the body or anything. There's a leaf at its neck. You can draw that. And if you want, you can draw the end of uh, or the body on the side. Or you can just omit that completely. And this fellow we will make in a good A5 size. So you have, um, you have lots of space to see it. I think I'll draw my chap in the middle. But just because I have planar paper over here. And here maybe I can draw the iguana. All right, keep your erasers handy. This is a very rare uh, request I keep in, in class. But today I want you to not feel scared about what you're making. All right, so the structure of the snake is fairly straightforward. You have a straight line from the left of the face a horizontal line for the mouth part, and a line that goes almost towards two o'clock. Then you have almost a horizontal line for the top of the head. <clears throat> from this side, from the left side, a line comes like this. So make sure that you at least have a, some kind of mental connection between the top left edge of the face and where the line emerges. If you draw the line too high, it will look odd because we have to establish this connection. From the right corner of the eye, uh, mouth. And draw all these lines in that proportion. Now, the neck bends down almost as far away as the measurement of the head itself. So don't make it too close. All the, uh, the measurements are there in the picture itself. All the clues are there. So here, look at where these central dark scales begin. And equidistant from the left, you would have the neck on the right. And then the inside part of the head, and then you have the, um, what is the thing called? The... It's called Fana in Marathi. Hood. Hood. It's a hood, correct, yes. Mm
All right. Now, once you have the basic shape in place, uh, we we just have to start constructing the scales. This is the basket weave all over again. But in this, there is there is some structure, uh, like the basket also. Drawing the structure itself can take time, but it's well worth it. Like, for example, you can just count the scales. They are not infinite. So you have the uh, slightly imperceptible scales of the mouth in a triangular shape that you will have a little nose or nostril here. Once you have drawn that, you start seeing the scales on the side. You have one, two, three, and then a big, a large pair of scales here. Now, in this, you will notice the lines. So, this line would be wrong. I have to make it slightly slanted and flatten the shape of scale. And build the next one on that. So I must be able to visualize the shape and size placement and position of these scales accurately in order for everything to be built properly. Uh, with this in place, now if I were to position the next two large scales which are on its forehead, have I drawn the hood to the right? scale. I can assess that. And instead of completing all the scales here, first I will draw the bunch of tiny scales that go up. And I notice that I've drawn the hood just a little larger than it should be, just ever so slightly. So it's not totally off, but this Line on top can be omitted. Now that I have the proportion in place, I can then start filling in the details and move from this section towards the outside. Very often, your proportions can change. So don't try to necessarily fit your the scale patterns in the rough image that you've made. You might have to adjust the rough lines to the scales you make. So in this case, my strategy to keep myself motivated and not bored when there's so much of shading and scale drawing to do is to switch between drawing, shading, drawing, shading uh, and work on a cumulative result, not just first sit. I do not have the discipline to first sit and draw all the scales and then come and robotically start shading. Because I, uh, in a, I am, I guess, as impatient as the next person to see the finished result. And I really enjoy the shading bit more than the drawing. So I will start shading from this end now.
And here the shading is just like normal shading. Once you've drawn the proportions, you can zoom into the picture. Do not, I mean, not do not, but avoid zooming in unless you've drawn the first basic proportions. Zooming in will throw off the proportions. So keep it only for detailing. And now scale by scale, we just go ahead and shade. Now, so far, I haven't used an eraser. And if you can avoid using the eraser, then nothing like it. We are going very slowly. So, and much of it is going to be shaded. So, even our rough lines can be absorbed into the picture. The spacing, um, not the space, The there is an edge along the scales that is high lit. So you should avoid shading that bit and keep that sliver unshaded. Here's where that sharp pencil comes in handy. If you're unfamiliar with shading, I would recommend shading in um, built up tones. So don't go and shade the darkest tone first. Build it up to that dark tone. If you're using a soft pencil, your initial tone itself should be fairly dark. And then you can just scribble over it another one more time or two more times and add up. That's a much better way to shade in details, unlike what we did in the first illustration, where we weren't really paying too much attention to that order of building up. Now, even in this case, how your lines join can be important. Extend a few lines if they feel better that way. Review the angles of your lines, the space occupied by the shapes. And in this now, you might need to erase a few of the lines from before because the space between 
our scales is in a negative color. Then on these scales on the left, you only see the dark edges. And the front is almost high lit. So you don't shade over there. Now, as we did the eye for the other animals, you can separately draw just the eye in close-up and uh, figure it out before you commit to the picture. That was one strategy, by the way, that worked for me every time, uh, drawing something in rough till I was convinced that what I was drawing was right.
and um, when I teach slightly younger kids, uh, with not slightly younger kids, older kids, like 15 year olds who might take on art or design later on, I have to keep telling them, they, they give exams, um, even school exams, don't encourage or don't give this option to students, especially in art. You must have a test paper to test out your color, consistency, and even drawing. Have you got the right shape? Or is your shape too um, big or small, compa comparing it to the original picture? Because there's a lot you can see after you have done, almost like uh, hindsight. After you have drawn it, you notice a lot of things that you could draw differently. And now the difference between a good uh, an artist and a beginner or even a student, young student, is the confidence that you will be able to repeat what you have drawn. I remember I used to make the illustration in rough and it would turn out beautiful. And then I didn't know whether I could repeat my success in fair that's that changes once you once your um, hand muscles build up uh, to make that predictable line then you will never doubt it, your line How is it going for everyone? Do you have any questions about this? Or do you think you can proceed with this shading? Okay, let me see when does. Hmm. Very nice. I think, Janita, you can lighten your hand a little bit. So keep multiple tones. Don't make it too dark. Or you can make it slightly lighter. Ah. Same here, Bhavani. Even your tones can be a little lighter and then the build-up of the dark can be even more gradual. Mine is looking like a very sweet cheetah. <laughs> it's not looking like a snake, venomous snake. It's looking like a very it's... good snake. I think it's too <laughs> short. This snout or what? No, no. Uh, the space between your scales is uh, more than too wide. Necessary. Ah. So that's why it's looking really more like. Why is looking so kind and like a cheetah and <laughs> not getting? <laughs> so funny. Okay, so I'll show you now how to make the scales in the neck region. These, this part you will get. For the neck, notice the lines uh, there's a row of scales right so you can draw the exact number of those rows of scales in that manner so you have scales like this then they spread out radially Correct. So you have five here and you can see the separation between them. They are closer on the left towards the neck and then as they come lower, they start becoming more parallel. So you start drawing these lines. Then once you've drawn those, or even at that point, instead of drawing straight lines, you can draw wobbly lines, but they wobble about at the same place. So you can draw a line that comes like this and wobbles here, and then wobbles right out. But if you're not confident, you can just make light lines to establish the orientation of the scales. 
and then finally uh, orientation placement all of that and then finally come and shade it so i'm going to show you how to do that part the part on the left and the right i think everyone will be able to handle this part i'm going to show you but i'm not going to show you the whole thing because i want to build the whole snake proportionately uh, from scale to scale as we go along so somewhere near the eye I can see the mouth somewhere over here. I'm sure that that is where it is. This is the scale. And this is the end of the mouth. And then next to the eye, I have one set of snail scales that goes in this order till about here. And this part comes in line with the scale that comes from this point. So I'm constantly looking at all the reference points that I get. Then the next one is slightly higher, goes a little higher. And this one goes like this. So I've got about three lines here. Now, I have seen a lot of people get this structure and then once they get it, just go ahead and make this the same line parallel without looking at the snake itself. And then I have seen people who not only look at that, look at even more details in the even drawing of the lines. The latter get better accuracy. Finishing the snake and creating a mediocre result is not our uh, goal. So I want you to spend time in keenly observing how the lines go. These lines can sometimes get so confusing. You don't know whether you've drawn the sixth line or the tenth line. So I wouldn't mind if you want to take a picture of this or even maybe a print or on your phone itself where you can mark one dot at a time for all the lines you finish. That's one. Or as you go along, you make your first five, six lines or whatever, shade those, create the detail that is necessary over there, and then move forward. So here we have like a triangular shadow, below which another triangular shadow. Oh, sorry, you are not able to see it. And look at the direction of those shadows. Those are very important. So behind, below every line, the shadow becomes a little wider at the top. And then in some places, it completely stops and just becomes like a line. So this is the texture. After you've made the texture, you will also create shadows. This is different from the coloring of the texture. And this is more universal because it uh, spreads across the whole line of scales but it does leave the gap between the scales probably because the end of the scale is like a little edge that rises up Okay, so do you want to just do a little bit over here and uh, then we can move on to that iguana sketch. So next Tuesday, I'm out of town, but uh, is everyone, is it possible for everyone to attend on a Wednesday? Same time on Wednesday, 11.30, we can have class. Yes. Yeah, I'm okay with that. What about okay. the other? Okay, good. 
so that we don't miss anything. We we finished three this week, right? So or uh, this month. So the last one will be on Wednesday. So that's the twenty eighth. The scales on the side, these are also very interesting. Wherever you have a scale that or any part that looks out of focus. The trick to make objects out of focus is to not put a very sharp edge on the line. Let me demonstrate this. If I want to show you, uh, uh, say, a dot in sharp focus, this is what I will do. But now, actually, you can see this even while I'm on camera. Can you see what happens to the pictures in the background when my hand comes here? Because the focus is on my hand. So everything becomes blurred. So look at what happens to the dot. You don't see the edge very sharp. The moment I remove it, you see the sharp edge. So if I want to make a dot that at visual, uh, at perfect visual length, should look like it is out of focus. I just need to smudge up the edges so it will start looking like a fuzzy edge dot and therefore out of focus. So the shapes over here seem to be either out of focus or not sharply colored items. Okay, are you all getting it? Okay. <laughs> so this will be your, uh, I guess, weekend project. So I'm going to recommend that you do maybe 20 minutes a day 
It should take several days to finish this. Oh, nice. Is it looking a little better now? Still looking very friendly, but I'm okay. just... so I'll tell you what's happened. This edge, hmm. the yeah. left side edge needs to come inward a little. In a bit, yeah, yeah. But very nice, Elena. His good. scales are, you know, the nose scales are not correct. So therefore, I'm not getting that shape. I'll have to do that shading again. You know, the flat top. Right. Something is wrong there. You just have to do it again. Cha if when you change its mouth line, uh, things ah. could look better. Maybe. Okay, shall we do the iguana? We have about 15 minutes. It's go That one's going to be a quick sketch and paint exercise. It turns out so nice uh, in the end. That's why I want, I'm insisting on it. Otherwise, I would have let you all complete the snake. But if you have understood it, then you can do it at your own time, in your own time. Okay. All right. So we'll take on the, you can draw both in time, but for today we'll take on this one because I haven't drawn this. The other one I think I have drawn two, three times already in other classes. <clears throat> so here again, we will make the illustration like we made the first snake. There are few features in the iguana which stand out literally. That's the spikes on the head. The eye is a lot bigger. The shape of the eyes, uh, the one that's visible, the one that's not visible, the nostrils, and this, uh, this something that the scale is called. This really large scale here. Um, so we are just going to draw the shape of the body, a few scribbles here and there. You can also draw a silhouette of the leaf, so you know why the iguana is partially hidden. And then we will paint this. These uh, paintings or what I call watercolor sketches are also a very good exercise to build up strength. They are quick exercises. So they're like a quick mm -hmm, uh, short distance running or a brisk walk for 10 minutes or whatever, equivalent to that. But it helps on various levels. It obviously helps your hand. It helps to understand color, composition and also consistency of paint. So we want to come to a level where your hand, your brush and uh, your paint becomes just an extension of one from the other. So that you are, when you are mixing colors, you know what is happening. And when you're applying colors, you know what to expect. So let's make the sketch about this large next to the snake. And pretty much like how we made the first snake. So first you can make the shape of the face. These are almost parallel lines. Mark out the spots. And while you're doing this, you will probably come to a point where you think you understand the structure and it could be anywhere. Like in my case, I, I can see the scale pretty well over here. The one scale from where I can draw the rest. <clears throat> and the scale, I think I can draw the eye. Remember for the eye, make the highlight. Notice how the 
center of the eye is not in the center of this oval because it's looking a little to the side. So there's more space on the right than on the left of this oval. Keep your lines firm, but they can be wobbly and casual. Don't try to make them too uh, precise and then land up making lines which look very tentative. Mm -hmm. so, and are too close. Since we are only making a casual sketch, you don't really need to make the details of your uh, illustration too accurate. But do look out for specific shapes that can be very characteristic because then that adds to the fun of your sketch. There are a lot of folds on this face. So try to draw the folds before you draw the texture. Now here as well, where the folds are, you will notice these same kinds of overlaps that we have in the snake. All right, this is enough, I think. Now, once this is done, we can 
scribble our texture all over. And in this scribbling, now remember that you can make the scribbles only in the dark areas. So this will become our base. So that when we add color or washes to this, the pencil lines already give us a sense of the texture. Make sure that along the edges, you have definitely put in some texture. Around the mouth. Again, some scribble texture. You can put some round scale like texture also over here. So it doesn't have to be completely scribbled like this. You can also make it like this. Some small circles, some big circles. And the best bit is you can keep these um, sporadic. You don't need to make them everywhere. Now on the back, there are definitely some larger shapes like warts. So make them in the kind of distribution that you see if you can. Or else you can shade with the scribble effect over there as well. And over here, the scribble can be even more pronounced because you barely even see the color of it. Likewise, just underneath here as well. Now we just need to paint the in color onto this. So I'm going to use a mix of Cambodge and orange and a little bit of lemon yellow also. So I'm hydrating lemon yellow, Cambodge, orange, and I suppose all these warm colors, they can be a little bit of yellow ochre, a little bit of scarlet and some burnt sienna as well. So this whole triangle of colors. And starting with the lightest color, I will first apply lemon yellow in this region. And I'm applying it very casually. So it's just staining the paper and then moving forward. The high, hardly any place where there is a light, completely light highlight. So you can just mix from one color to the next. Orange now. Around the eye. And in places where the orange is not so pronounced, we could add a little bit of yellow ochre or uh, raw umber, which is on this side. There is some highlight on the eyes and the top of the nose. Now notice how my colors, though I'm picking them from the cake itself, are very light. The consistency is very watery. That allows my paints to remain fairly uh, I guess 
light on paper after they dry. Now I'm using a combination of orange and burnt sienna to paint the body. But notice how I can drag the color away from the dark sections, from the light section, sorry. So I've applied it here, but I can pull the color away and it becomes much lighter if I want to. So I can pull this here. I've wiped my brush and pulled that dark shade onto the body. And I can also deposit color at the base of these and pull it outward. Now I'm using a size 10 brush, but you can do this whole exercise with a thick and a thin brush. So deposit a color with a thick brush very lightly and then use a thin brush to pull it outward. And you can do this maybe two or three scales at a time. You don't need to do all. Remember to just stain the paper. Don't keep going over and over that space. And when the paint is wet, don't bother correcting anything. As the paint dries up, you can add a second layer of maybe shadows. And where there are deeper shadows, you can add the shadow with burnt umber. So it will be reinforcing the pencil lines that we have made. Now I'm going to do, take a nice light uh, yellow, not yellow, what am I saying? Burnt sienna color and paint the eye a little more carefully than I have painted the rest of the body because I am very partial to good looking eyes and pictures. So here I'll paint this in burnt sienna and add a little bit of burnt umber towards the bottom and towards the top while the paint is wet so that I get a nice um, shade there. You can paint the center of the eye using black. And then once the pupil has dried, we can use black again for this shadow underneath. Okay, so now this should be done in no more than 15 minutes. I think we've done it. Now, when I do this painting, uh, I'm going to just do a little extension. You don't have to do this. I try to expand my exploration of color by adding in colors which I would not have done for a realistic illustration, like adding blues and greens where I see browns and yellows, like the space between the, all the uh, scales does not have to be black. What if it were blue? What if there were blue shadows? Or these features here. So we must recognize that the whole point of painting or creating art is not always to imitate photography. We are limiting ourselves. It's like when uh, 
women say that they have to become as strong as men. No, we are differently strong. We can be strong in our own right. There's no comparison. So photography has its advantages. That's great. But uh, painting, in painting, your entire canvas is yours to decide what you want to do with. So you must try to take every opportunity to experiment a little bit and do something that is slightly different or something that you've never done before and test it out. Uh, also, it helps to look for these maverick tricks in other artists work so for example when shadows are made in a color that is that you might not think shadows should be made how that looks just respond to that and put that in your bank of techniques that you would like to try and then on an occasion like this when you're just doing a 15 minute watercolor sketch try that out um, it may look good in the beginning. It may not look good. Sometimes colors put together may, may muddy the situation. But whatever it is, you can objectively analyze it and see where it could be most useful and then bring it into your practice. Okay, so are, any questions? Any? Um, would you like to share any of your stuff? It's really quick, but a little messy. I think if I do it a little slower next time. Um, I haven't finished it, but here he is. No, that's good. Messy the is... The leg and under the, you know, the neck and all got a little messy with the amber. But yeah, yeah I'm just doing the rest. Yeah. No, this is good. This is exactly how it begins. I haven't colored mine yet. I wasn't ready with the colors, so okay. I'll do it later. All right. Oh, very nice. Janita's is looking good. Very good. See, very nice. Wonderful. Cool. So, you all can finish the... Character. Yeah, finish the uh, Cobra in time. <laughs> and I'm going to try and share today's video today itself. And then we are going to meet on Wednesday next. All right. Okay. See you then, everyone. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. 11.30. 11.30. 11.30. On Thursday. Uh, on Tuesday. Wednesday. Wednesday. I'm so sorry. On Wednesday. Wednesday. Yes. 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 Thank okay. you. Bye. 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 Bye.